with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Getting back on track for parents means two things, at least in this COVID-19 era. School and child care. Both pose tough choices right now. Tonight, the thus far insurmountable challenge of getting affordable care for kids and why it's an issue for all Ontarians. Then, a look at what parents who've opted out of the school system and into homeschooling can expect in the year to come. It's Monday, September 14th, and that's next on The Agenda. If you can find it, childcare in Ontario is the most expensive in the country. That was true before COVID-19. Now with the pandemic's disruption, that has hit the capacity of the whole sector and what was already often called a crisis has only gotten worse. Joining us now for a look at why it's a problem, not just for parents and operators, in St. Catharines, Ontario, Kate Bazanson, Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and Associate Dean of Social Sciences at Brock University. And from the provincial capital, Carolyn Ferns, Public Policy and Government Relations Coordinator for the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care. And Elizabeth Dewey, Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Toronto. And we're delighted to have the three of you on TVO tonight for an important and timely discussion. And let's just go through this on alphabetical order. I know each of you could give me uh, a very long answer to this first question, but hopefully I can encourage you just to give, give us a single piece of the puzzle as to how the pandemic has affected childcare in a different way from the previous crises that we have discussed on this program in the past. Uh, go ahead, Kate, start us off. So thanks, Steve, and it's lovely to be here with you today. I'd say that childcare has hit a serious crisis point in pandemic. We know that when the pandemic hit, women were the first called or pushed out of the labor market as a result of caregiving responsibilities and because of the sectors of employment that they were in. When the economy started to reopen and childcare capacity started to, to come back, we saw that both the costs of delivering that childcare escalated and parents were also either apprehensive or couldn't afford to send those kids back to those spaces that existed. So we now face a situation of some, some child care deliverers actually permanently closing, which will stunt, stall, hobble our economic recovery. Elizabeth Dewey, what would you add to that? You know, everything she said is perfectly correct. I think um, what the pandemic has shown us is how fragile the system is, and it's going to really hurt our economy if we don't get this correct going forward. And Carolyn Ferns? So I absolutely agree, but um, I'd say that childcare has never been more essential, at the same time, never more fragile. Um, so I used to talk about childcare as being a silent crisis because it relied upon parents, you know, to get on those 13 waiting lists, try to find the money to pay the fees. It also relied on early child educators to, you know, scrape by on very low wages. And it was a silent crisis because those people sort of struggled alone, quietly um, making it work or trying to make it work. But what the pandemic has done has really um, made that crisis visible to everybody. Any employer who has, you know, is on a Zoom call with a parent with a toddler crawling on their head knows that we have So it's essential. We can see that now. But the sector, as, as Kate said, has never been more vulnerable, never more fragile, um, because it now costs more, you know, because of health and safety um, reasons to provide child care. At the same time, many parents, you know, hard hit by the economic recession are even less able to pay child, those high child care fees than they did before. Maybe they're still working at home and they're reticent to send their children back. Um, so the sector is very vulnerable right now. And that's why we really need to see uh, moving forward a greater investment. Well, I was just going to follow up on this cost angle, because if it is the impression of those watching us right now that child care has been off the charts expensive, it's not their imagination. We've got some numbers here from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And Sheldon Osmond, our director, I'm going to ask you to bring up this chart. And for those listening on podcast, I'll describe it a little bit. This is a snapshot of what fees looked like last year in the province of Ontario. And not surprising, 
Toronto, the capital city, is the most expensive city in Canada with a median cost of more than $1,700 a month for childcare. The cheapest rates in this province are apparently in Windsor, Ontario, down around $868 a month. But if you check this list, number two through seven, second through seventh most expensive municipalities in the country, Vaughan, Markham, Oakville, Mississauga, Kitchener, Richmond Hill, Brampton clocks in at number 10. Basically, it means that the GTA cities made up almost all of the 10 costliest cities in the country for child care. And um, Elizabeth, maybe follow up on that. Why is child care so much more expensive in and around the provincial capital than anywhere else in the country? Well, it comes to having child care is a very labor intensive um, industry and your childcare workers have to live somewhere nearby so we need to pay them somewhat so they can sort of as said before scrape by so um places with higher cost of living are going to have to pay um their their um workers more money and that's since it's so highly intensive in terms of labor you it just goes right into the cost also you know you have higher real estate costs everything is more expensive in the GTA. And so that's just going to be shown in this childcare costs. Carolyn, any sense about how those numbers would stack up compared to, say, other big cities uh, or medium sized cities uh, around the OECD? Oh, around the OECD, um, we fare very badly. Ontario has some of the highest childcare costs in the world. Um, but even if we compare it across provinces, one of the interesting things to look at is the, you know, the childcare costs. And for parents in Ottawa versus across the river in Gatineau, um, where of course the Quebec system, you know, uh, subsidizes childcare more, and childcare is much more affordable for parents. So why are childcare costs so expensive here in Ontario? It's a policy decision. It's because we allow it to be that way. If there was more public funding going to support the system, to lower parent fees, to really make it affordable for parents, and to allow early child educators to earn a decent wage then we would have a stronger childcare system. We would have one that was better for parents and better for, for everyone, frankly. I'm just looking at that list again that we just put up, and Ottawa is number 11 on the list at just over $1,000 a month. There it is again. It's at the bottom of the chart, but still, $1,000 a month. And Kate, maybe I'll get you to pick up the story here. That compares to $180 a month on the other side of the river in Gatineau, <laughs> Quebec. More than 1,000 versus 180. What's the implication of all of that? The implication, of course, is massive. And we see already from, from StatsCan data that shows that there are gender employment gaps depending on the cost of childcare in the city in which you live. So if we just look at the Ottawa Gatineau region, the gender employment gap on the Quebec side was 2.6 percentage points compared to 7.3 percentage points on the Ottawa side. And this likely reflects the significant, massive investments that the Quebec government has made since the early 90s in a comprehensive family policy that includes an affordable, publicly, publicly managed child care system that sets fee caps for parents. You know, the strange thing is, if you look at the amount of debt and deficit the province of Quebec is carrying right now, it's not as bad as Ontario's on a per capita basis. So they've decided to invest more in child care, and apparently their debt and deficit is not any worse than ours for it. What do you infer from that, Kate? Well, child care largely pays for itself as an investment. And one of the things that's really interesting coming out of the, the sort of Quebec experiment, if we want to call it that, is that one of the significant results of it has been a significant increase in women's labor market participation and, and a concomitant decrease in levels of child and household poverty. So as, as an illustration, um, in between 1997 and 2016, the labor force participation rate of mothers in Quebec of children aged zero to five increased by 16 percentage points from 64 to 80 percent. And elsewhere in Canada, the increase was just four points from 67 to 71 percent. So we see that those kinds of public policy investments have significant impacts both on labor market participation, but also on the downstream effects. They're on taxation uh, levels increase. So governments get Get more money, including hilariously, the federal government actually has done quite well out of the taxation revenue generated by women's labor market participation in Quebec. But we also see really important child development outcomes. So it's a system that, for every dollar invested, yields more than double in returns. Elizabeth, let's do another comparison, and this time not to a province like Quebec, which is not dissimilar from Ontario uh, in terms of 
size and makeup and so on. Let's do Northwest Territories. That's pretty different from Ontario. What did you find there when you looked at the NWT? You know, looking there, it's, it's a different place in Ontario and Quebec. Um, the same story is that it's a really good investment to, to put money, government money, into childcare. Specifically in the Northwest Territories, when we looked at it, it was actually a better deal for the government to invest in childcare than mining, diamond mining, one of their huge industries that people are very concerned about, spend a lot of time, political um, thought about. But actually, if they're going to put a dollar into childcare, it's going to be a better deal than a, a dollar into their mining industry. It's a pretty big deal. We, uh, you know, we do talk about this subject quite frequently on this program, as recently as just a few days ago, when Armin Yalnesian, who is, uh, of course, a well-known economist and uh, Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers, uh, she and I talked about this. And uh, let's play a little snippet of that conversation, and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Shelton, if you would. Childcare is the choke point on recovery. Mm -hmm. And childcare is treated as a market delivered system. It too is functioning with loss of user fees and higher costs, and more of them will shudder. And we're just standing by uh, watching this social, vital social infrastructure collapse because of market forces. So there's some sectors that we actually need to immediately address and prevent further loss in. Carolyn, can I start by getting you to follow up on that, why addressing child care is so essential to a post-pandemic recovery? What's the argument? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as always, Ar Armin just hit the nail on the head. Um, it, is, it is essential both to economic recovery and social recovery. And it's important that we tackle it quickly because, as Armin pointed out, um, the child care sector right now is very unstable. And we know that here in Ontario, just over half of Ontario's child care centres have reopened at this point. And what we worry about is that some of those that are still closed may never reopen, right? And it's primarily because, you know, right now, they're temporarily have low enrollment. Now, we know the usual story in child care is that there are lots of wait lists, that it's hard to get a space, that they're oversubscribed. And right now, we have the opposite situation, a very low enrollment, which means child care centres deficits are which means that they may close down permanently. But again, we know that's a temporary situation. Um, if we look at, say, um, emergency room usage, there was a great study from back in the SARS pandemic that showed that it took two years for emergency room visits to go back to normal post-pandemic, right? But we never thought, oh, well, I guess we could just let that emergency room close because we know that we would need it, right? But childcare, because it's left to the market, because it's, you know, each individual, sometimes a volunteer parent board, trying to figure out how to keep the doors open. We're just going to stand by and, and watch the whole sector collapse unless, you know, the province and the federal government wake up and make a strong investment into child care, understanding that it's essential to our economic recovery and also essential to social recovery. Young children who have been uh, experiencing this pandemic, you know, have had their daily routines upended. Um, they need a strong quality child care system it can help them look to a brighter future. So I see it as an investment not only in the economy, but also in our, our social fabric. Kate, I think the thing we need to better understand is, uh, you know, people like you have made the arguments for years, people like the three of you and others have made the arguments for years as to why this makes sense to do. And yet, um, you know, it hasn't happened yet. And we ha it's not like we haven't had any progressive governments in case, or it's not like they're even conservative governments that don't understand the importance of child care. Uh, whatever's supposed to happen hasn't happened yet. Why not? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think there's, there are several sides to that question. Of course, there's the question of political will. There's the question of child care's benefits accruing over time. So it takes time to build the capacity of the child care labor force to develop a strong, well-remunerated, well-trained labor force. It also takes time to build out centers and to build out the kind of spaces that are needed. So those investments aren't turn on a switch, like you would, for example, with roads and bridges. Here, I'm going to put my shovels in the ground. A social infrastructure-led recovery is exactly the right tool for this moment, but it takes longer to to see the benefits and a political cycle is usually four years long so you don't see those benefits that you can run on as easily with this investment is that a reason not to do it 
absolutely not. It's actually a cowardly reason not to do it. It's easier to show a road. It's harder to show, you know, 100,000 new childcare spaces. But those benefits over 10 years will have massive GDP effects. One estimate that, that my colleagues and I came up with is that every percentage point increase for women's labor market participation in Canada yields $1.85 billion in, in GDP growth. So it is a smart bet and a smart investment. It takes political will and it takes absolutely the right design. And I hope that's something we can canvas a little bit because there's good childcare and there's not so good childcare. Well, okay, let me follow up on that. And I'll, and I'll play a bit of the heavy here just for argument's sake. Uh, Carolyn, pick up on this if you would. I wonder if part of the problem among governments is that the child care sector itself has not been of unanimous voice in, you know, should child care be nonprofit or for profit? Should it be only, uh, you know, in the public sector or is there a role for the private sector to hold as well? Uh, I wonder if whether these arguments within the sector have have given the wiggle room for governments not to do anything because they can simply say, well, you guys haven't got your act together yet. So how can we have ours together? Hmm. Well, I think that that's, that's possible um, in the past. But again, what's happened with the pandemic is that um, it's really focused um, exactly what the problem is. Um, and we've, we've seen that the childcare system being in this, being the market-based, uh, you know, sort of patchwork that we've had is unworkable, right? And that we need to move forward to build a stronger public system. Um, and I think that that's more clear than ever. Um, because we've seen that because of the fragility that we've seen over the last uh, six months. And uh, I think so we know that we need to have a public investment um, to actually grow the system and that just creating spaces alone isn't enough. Just providing funding alone isn't enough. Um, and that actually more funding into a poorly organized system is actually going to be a waste of money. And that's why I think a lot, um, you really, uh, a chorus of, of advocates are now saying the same thing, that it's not just about the money, it's about the system. It's about mm -hmm. building a strong system. And so that I hope is what um, certainly the, the provincial government and definitely the federal, federal government need to hear. It's about creating a system now. Well, Elizabeth, I wonder if you're a private daycare operator and you're listening to that answer, are you going to say to yourself, uh-huh, see, she's only interested in a system in the public sector as part of a, you know, a broader education system, if you like, and she's leaving me out of the equation. What about that? You know, um, as an economist, I'm fairly agnostic about the politics that's going on in this world. Um, I believe there are a lot of politics between the, the providers. And I think at this moment in time, what we need to focus on is not the individual providers. I, I'm sorry if it's hard for any individual person, they, but we need to focus on the system and doing high quality investment into the system using sort of more um, municipally grounded systems, having more, um, more centers working together. We get a lot of economies of scale and that's going to be cost effective. So um, I think we just need to think very broadly, not politically at the moment, to fix a system, build a new system, change a system, make sure that everybody can have a new place in the new whatever system there is, and make it cost effective and make it high quality. So in that's my agnostic economist view. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In which case, let's start to go through this. Kate, what does that new and improved, better, more accessible, higher quality child care system actually look like? Well, it has many pieces, and I think right now what we need to focus on is the immediate term building to the long term. So in the immediate term, the child care sector is in crisis and needs to be backstopped. The existing stock of spaces need to be girded and need to be supported so that they exist. Now, let's remember, we know that schools are going to be there for our kids next year, the year after, because because schools are, education is a right of every child and a responsibility of every provincial government, territorial well, it's government. it's mandated in law. It's mandated in law. Child care enjoys no such protection. Hmm. The other side of this and the other risk is that what we can face is a situation where we have a really uneven recovery across the country. 
where where you live can determine what you get in childcare and what your labor market prospects are and therefore how you recover. This is this is our first she session. It's our first pink collar recession. It's really going to matter that women get back into the labor force. And so what you see is the maturity of a childcare system, the maturity of a childcare system for example in Quebec may likely fare better economically than a system that is less developed in other parts of the country. So what I'm looking for is the kind of collaboration that we have seen in pandemic unprecedented collaboration between the federal government and municipal government uh, uh, provincial territorial governments to do what's absolutely needed which is to build away from the kind of really difficult patchwork childcare approach that we have had largely in this country that has placed Canada at the bottom of international rankings. Canada spends 0.23% of its GDP on early childhood education and care compared to 2% in the countries that are leading in this area. So we not but we need to invest money but we also need to have really good design that builds out a system that has the three principles of quality, affordability and accessibility baked in. An overfocus on affordability denudes those other two sides of that three-legged stool of the capacity to build a system and to have it reliably be there for people over the long term. Our recovery depends on it and our kids depend on it. Carolyn, I'm going to ask you to follow up with a very political question because you do spend your time uh, advocating with governments on how to get this done. We have in this country uh, liberals federally. We have new Democrats in British Columbia. We have progressive conservatives in Ontario. We have something called the Coalition pour l'avenir du Québec, the Coalition for the Future of Quebec in Quebec. Is there one party that gets this issue better than others in your view? Hmm. That's a, a really good question. It's a, a really tough question. And we've certainly seen... Um, I would say that there is no one party that has got it perfectly perfectly right across the country. Um, and one of the things I think we need to see um, is actually different parties, different levels of government collaborating on child care. And I know that maybe sounds pie in the sky, but you know, when this pandemic started, we saw people come together. We saw people of different political stripes come together and say, we need to move together as a nation uh, dealing with this crisis head on. And that crisis has now changed and evolved, the, the, the type of crisis that we're facing. And now we are facing a care crisis. And so I think we do need to see the, the federal government, the liberal federal government, and the conservative government here in Ontario playing ball with each other, actually collaborating on it. And I don't think that that's too optimistic to say. I think it's a necessity. Um, and of course, here in Ontario, we also need the municipalities um, there. And I know that they are. Um, ready to to work on childcare. So frankly, I think that we really need to see um, an unprecedented um, collaboration across uh, the provinces, territories, and federal government to address an unprecedented crisis. Well, all right, to that end, Elizabeth, we have seen, frankly, unprecedented collaboration between the current prime minister and the current premier of Ontario and their cabinet ministers uh, all the way down the line. And the results have been, uh, you know, uh, there have been a lot of compliments for things like the CERB and the backstop for wages and, uh, you know, tenant protection and anyway, all the way down the line. Uh, how optimistic are you, Elizabeth, that you're going to see the same kind of collaboration and cooperation when it comes to child care? Um, unfortunately, I'm not optimistic at all. Um, I feel like I hope I'm wrong and I'm going to be very excited if I'm wrong. I just don't see... Um, how it's going to change, because this has been an issue for a really, really long time. The big problems is people see childcare differently than other industries. It's probably because it's female-dominated, um, probably because some people want females to stay home with their kids early on. And so I, I the political cycle and how politics works, I, I'm not very optimistic, unfortunately. I wish I could say I was super optimistic, and I hope someone comes back to me in a couple months and say, you were wrong, and I'll be very happy to be wrong. But... Katie, are you going to be one of those people? Um, I hope I am. I have, I would say I have cautious optimism and for no other reason than, I mean, for many reasons, but instrumentally for the following reason. My neighbor down the street who's got three kids who needs childcare is not going to run to sections 91 and 92 of the Constitution and say, <laughs> oh, today I should be really angry with the provincial government for this one. 
at, at any elected official. So the first person she sees, whether it's the prime minister or her MP or our ward counselor, she's going to say, where's the child care? This is what matters to me. This is what matters to my family. Our, our sustainability and our household functioning depends on it, and the economy depends on it. And instrumentally, everyone's head is on the proverbial block on this one. So get together and do the right thing. No, I appreciate what you're saying. Having said that, I mean, the Constitution is there. It is a real thing. The powers of the federal government are in Section 91. The powers of the provincial government are in Section 92. And um, these things can get quite ticklish when the feds decide to do things that doesn't come technically on their to-do list. Uh, so to that end, Carolyn, I wonder... What what can be the federal role here, given that this is technically, constitutionally, a provincial responsibility? Well, I think that we've seen uh, the federal government um, moving more and, you know, getting more involved in uh, early childhood education and care. And I think that it is a, a, a great role that they uh, can play to provide uh, leadership. I think that there is nothing stopping having national legislation having a federal secretariat that can try to coordinate um, work on early child education and care across the country. Um, certainly, they have a funding role to play. And, you know, as we've seen with the agreements on child care so far, they can set limits on how that money is spent. And, you know, with greater federal spending, they could perhaps, spe uh, you know, provide greater direction on how that uh, money is being spent. So I think that there is an already an opening for collaboration between the uh, provinces and the federal government and territories and the federal government on child care. Um, it's now about really uh, stepping up, facing the, you know, the crisis that we have in child care honestly, and starting to, to, to you know, make greater investments really uh, directly building. Yeah, Kate, I don't want to get too deeply in the weeds here, but I think the reality is, and I'm going back about a decade and a half now, if memory serves, maybe a little longer, uh, Ken Dryden, who, when he was a minister of the Crown in the uh, previous Liberal government, you know, he was he was hamstrung by the Constitution in signing a national child care agreement, but he got it done by signing individual agreements with each individual province. Now, it took a heck of a lot longer, and it's a lot more cumbersome, but at the end of the day, he got it done. Yeah. I guess my question is, had that system stayed in place and had the Harper government not subsequently cancelled all of that, where would we be today that we're now not today? Well, I, I think, I, I, I hope, if it had rolled out the way that it was imagined to be rolled out, that the most of the country would look a lot like Quebec, where we have had a significant increase in women's labor market participation, where we've had a significant fee cap, where it's been more accessible, it's been more uh, affordable. And I think we would see a, a more resilience in this particular pandemic. What the pandemic has actually exposed is the care vulnerabilities that, that were always underlying our economic system. But those now have been put in stark relief. And moving forward, the, the prospect of not just a gender regressive recovery, you know, we saw recently a poll come out that one third of mothers have considered leaving the labor market in pandemic for caregiving reasons. We've seen that women's economic recovery, especially for those with young children, has stalled. And child care, as Armin has said, is the choke point in this. So um, I am, uh, my sense is that we have a an imperative right now and a kind of different kind of national consensus than we've had before. I think that our policy imaginary has also shifted in pandemic. We've seen a role for the federal government in a way that we haven't seen historically. And this is something we haven't faced before. And in every crisis, we have reimagined our federation. And this is one of those moments of reimagining our federation, both in service of economic recovery and also in service of building back better and fixing a system that was really a market system and not an accessible public system. We, um, yeah, Kate, maybe follow up with this. We did have uh, Aaron O'Toole, the new leader of the Conservative Party, on our program last Friday. And, um, you know, there were so many issues that I wanted to get to. I'm not sure I put a question to him on this, but, but we do know that he is a pro-choice, pro-LGBTQ, uh, pro-same-sex marriage. Um, let's put it this way. He's a fairly different Conservative leader from what that party is accustomed to. Has anybody that you know of had a chat with him about child care and do you know where he stands on it? 
Well, he, <laughs> I haven't had a chat with him. <laughs> um, I would welcome a chat with him. <laughs> um, I did have a chance to look at the, the platform documents that he's put together and the kind of policy proposals that are being put forward uh, from his platform really mirror the kind of conservative policy approaches that we've seen in the past around child care that have had a significant focus largely on the affordability side of things. So that focus, there's my puppy, of course, barking. I need to <laughs> right, on <laughs> right on cue. Right on cue. Um, on the affordability side of things, so a focus on on tax credits, a focus on um, uh, re tax rebates, and while affordability is a really important part of the childcare puzzle, we know that childcare is is so hard to afford for so many families. The reality is, is that I could give you $6,000 a year, Steve, to go and buy childcare, and you would have to find likely the cheapest form of child care available. And what that would do is stimulate low wage female employment, which puts us in the virtuous cycle that got us into this situation in the first, first place with unaffordability. Hmm. Uh, Elizabeth, you're the economist, so let me put this to you. If, if the conservative policy on this today, and again, he's just in as the new leader, so we don't know where, we don't completely know where he is on this issue. If it's essentially the same as the former Harper policy, which is essentially to sort of uh, you know, offer parents a subsidy but not actually build the system anymore. What would be your view on that? You know, my view would be, you know, my negative view from a little bit before holds and that we need to reimagine, we need to think about wage subsidies so that we attract more individuals into the market. We need to think about quality. We need to do so many new and innovative things to make the system robust, to go forward. It's gonna have great economic impact in terms of short term, long term, like it's a no brainer to me. So I don't understand why we're still talking about small tax credits. I mean, they're big ish, but it's not, you know, that's not gonna give you enough to go out as a woman with young kids and actually find care. So I feel like it's the same old, same old when we really need to tackle the problem today in 2020. Carolyn Ferns, let me give you the last 30 seconds on that same question. Well, certainly, I mean, I, from the provincial uh, government, dealing with a conservative government here in Ontario, the Ford government, we've seen, um, you know, sort of an evolution in their position um, from one where they were cutting $80 million from childcare spending and talking incessantly about their tax credit um, to one where I saw Minister Lecce uh, together with the federal minister last week um, you know, accepting the, you know, the federal government's, uh, you know, investment into childcare, talking about how essential childcare was. So we've seen an evolution in the province's rhetoric on childcare from a conservative government. Um, but what we really need to see now is actually them sitting down and collaborating with the federal government to move childcare to a much more uh, stable uh, place that can actually support um, our economic and our social recovery. That's Carolyn Ferns from the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care. Thanks also to Elizabeth Dewey, Associate Professor, Economics, University of Toronto, and Kate Bazanson, Associate Professor, Department of Sociology, and the Associate Dean of Social Sciences at Brock University in St. Catharines. We'll talk puppy care next time as well, Kate. Uh, <laughs> thanks to the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight. Really grateful for your time. Thank you. Thanks so much. As parents confronted choices this summer about online schooling versus in-person class during the pandemic, some opted for a third option, homeschooling. It may sound straightforward, but do parents really know what they're getting into? With us now on that, in Thedford, Ontario, in Lambton County, there's Sarah Hornblower. She is a mother of seven who has been homeschooling her kids for the past 17 years. And in the provincial capital, Carlo Ricci, professor in Nipissing University's Schulich School of Education and a longtime volunteer with the Ontario Federation of Teaching Parents. And Todd Cunningham. He's an assistant professor in the teaching stream at the U of T's Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and a school and clinical psychologist. And it's great to have you three on TVO with us tonight about this. Carlo, maybe just um, some technicalities off the top here because homeschooling can refer to a pretty broad swath of different things. Um, can you explain the different learning configurations you have seen it applied to? Well, when people homeschool, some people try to replicate the school curriculum so they can go as far as trying to create a classroom in their home where they try to do exactly what the schools uh, do. And other people try a, a more relaxed approach 
uh, sometimes known as unschooling or self-directed learning, or what I like to call willed learning, W-I-L-L-E-D, where uh, the learner gets uh, is empowered and gets to decide what to learn, where to learn, how to learn, for how long, whether to opt in or opt out. So uh, people do it uh, in a number of different ways. Okay. Todd, what is your take on homeschooling? Well, I, I think it's a great option that many parents have uh, available um, to them. But I think whenever we kind of think about ho um, homeschooling, we also have to think about kind of di different purposes. One of the key things that we really want our students to do is develop some essential skills uh, as students, the ability to read and read accurately and fast and understand what they're reading, to be able to write and communicate their ideas through written um, expression, the ability to be able to do math. And so, so sometimes when we're doing homeschooling, we have to ensure that there are critical components in the schooling day to really help develop those key academic skills. Sarah, why have you chosen to homeschool your kids? We actually started for less than stellar reasons. Um, my oldest was going into JK and I had just had um, our fourth child and it was almost a two kilometer walk to the school and the idea of getting four little kids out the door to walk almost two kilometers both ways um, was not a good idea to me at the time and um, so we thought we'd try it for a year and then we ended up loving it so here we are 17 years later. Hmm. And what do you feel homeschooling has been able to do for your children that you weren't sure that the public system or even a, a, a private school system would be able to do? Um, for us what's been really great is the ability for me to tailor what my kids need uh, to each of their individual needs. Um, several of my children have special needs and the school system, um, we did have our children in um, the public school system off and on over those 17 years. Um, and the school system at times was not able to um, meet the needs of the children as well. Um, they just didn't have the resources available um, that we had at home. And one more follow up here. What are you hearing from other parents uh, who may be doing what you're doing as to why they're doing it right now during this pandemic? Um, right now, the, um, a lot of parents who are joining right now are because either uh, mom or dad may have a um, compromised immune system. Um, people who are keeping their kids home for JK and SK, um, there's a lot of fear about the post-COVID classroom um, and what has been removed from the classroom. Uh, there's a lot of kids who would not tolerate the mandatory masking that's available. Uh, there's just a lot of unknowns. Um, same with parents are fearing the second wave and if a child has to come home again and what that will do to them. Well, Carla, it does raise the question of whether or not this pandemic has sort of opened a, a door even wider to people trying homeschooling who might not have tried it before. What are you hearing about that? Yes, um, numbers have increased uh, at the Ontario Federation of Teaching Parents. Our numbers have gone up probably 40% over last year, uh, people who are becoming members. And um, so we went from about 370 last year to 519 most recent from September 2nd to uh, September 30th in that short or September 10th in that short time frame. We've had 30 more people sign up to the Ontario Federation of Teaching Parents. And uh, our rates did go down, but it's only in the tens of, of dollars. So it's not very uh, likely that that's the reason why people are moving over. And there are also, you know, uh, a Gallup poll published August 25th, 2020, revealed that 10% of American families with children of school age are intending to homeschool their children this year. That's a huge increase uh, up from 5% a year ago. And... Um, Jim Mason, vice president of the Homeschooling Legal Defense Association, said that the phones are ringing off the hook as record numbers of people are inquiring about homeschooling. And the National Homeschool Association reported receiving 3,400 requests for information in a single day this summer in contrast to the typical 5 to 20 increase per day prior to the, uh, the pandemic. So um, in short, numbers are uh, definitely uh, more interested is but being, uh, realized. Okay, but Carlo, just to be clear, th this is all pandemic motivated, presumably, yes? Um, I, I, I mean, it makes sense to me that the numbers are going up. Um, for example, uh, you know, parents might for the have been forced into homeschooling because of what's going on uh, with the mainstream school system. But while they're in it now, they would have recognized and realized that this is actually a good option for our family. For the first time, maybe they might be witnessing um, by spending more time with their children in the schoolwork, realizing that 
this is what my children are actually doing in school. I could do a better job than that. And some parents are realizing that their children are not doing well mentally. Uh, school has a, a, a dark side to it. For example, uh, during the school year, students take more prescription medications. They check themselves into hospitals, commit suicide, report being stressed. Incidents of child abuse go up when report cards are handed out. Uh, doctors are still trying to figure out why kids get more headaches during back-to-school season. Uh, Peter Gray talks about how... Um, in a survey a few years ago, the American Psychological Association found that teenagers are the most anxious people in America, that 83% cited school as a source, if not the source of anxiety. Uh, Dr. Black, Dr. Tyler Black, was a child psychologist in British Columbia. He wrote in a recent podcast in the Toronto Star, uh, my job is easy during summer and non-school days because kids are less in crisis. I see less kids and my primary research interest being suicide we know for certain uh, that the highest rates of suicide are during school months and school days for kids. Okay, Carlo, um, jumping in here, because I, 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 sure. I, I want to hear Todd on this as well. You are a school and clinical psych uh, psychologist. I mean, the, the you know, almost apocalyptic description we just heard of what it's like to be a, a child in the school system in the province of Ontario today um, may belie the fact that 95% of the children in this province are reasonably successfully educated in the public school system, um, English, French, Catholic. Um, you want to just comment on what you heard from Carlo? Yeah, you know, when we have uh, this schools in, there's increased stress levels um, in st students. But overall, we see a lot of protective factors that school brings. You know, not only does school, we rely on school to and teach the academics, but we, it's also a wonderful place for socialization that that takes place. We can create very, um, a lot of students have very safe learning environments that they're a part of, that they can enjoy and explore new ideas that they might not have been able to get in other areas. And I think one of the concerns that we have about just kind of so many um, families choosing to go to homeschooling is the idea that there's still some critical skills that we need to ha happen. We, My fear is we're going to say we're going to use homeschooling, but a lot of kids are just going to spend their days on devices, watching uh, TV or doing other types of games and not actually interacting socially with, with others um, their, their age or really helping develop those key academic skills. And what we know is these key academic skills, the ability to read, write and do mathematics, they need to be practiced and they need to be taught in a very systematic way. And um, if we don't have that kind of structure of the, the school system um, kind of guiding our a, a person who's at least guiding them through that the development of those skills, then we could lead to a situation where those skills don't develop as we would expect them to be. Well, let Not me saying ask that the parents obvious... can't do that, but um, it's definitely something that parents will have to really attend to to ensure that their children are getting the essential skill developments. Let me ask the obvious follow-up, Todd. Is homeschooling potentially right for everyone? No, I don't think homeschooling is potentially right for everybody. You know, some families, um, due to the work situations that are going on, both parents have to be working, and there is no one there to guide the student through that learning process. Sometimes the parent-child relationship um, has certain conflicts within it, and the, the parent isn't a suitable teacher because it's going to create too much stress, and therefore that, that relationship is going to be um, more strained. Um, parents themselves might be under a lot of stress within the home and therefore they can't give the, the emotional resources towards the child to be able to help them in, in their development. So no, it's, it's not a, um, a, something that all families should consider. Okay, Sarah, let me come back to you on this. What are, um, I mean, bullying is an issue in schools. We have to recognize that. Uh, as good as many of the public schools in this province are, bullying is an issue. And I wonder how often you hear that, either in your circumstances or from other parents, as to an explanation why homeschooling makes sense as opposed to sending a bullied child to school. Um, we experienced that personally um, with our youngest. Uh, when he was in kindergarten, he came home uh, most days in tears. Uh, there was a young uh, child in the class and they did not um, get along um, well and um, he didn't take it well and so he came home for that reason um, but we see that a lot especially as we get to the mid part of the school year 
um, the increase for requests on the various social media boards that um, I help admin. Uh, we see that concern an awful lot um, of children feeling bullied, feeling powerless within the system. And so um, parents make the choice or arrive at the decision that they need to homeschool. So uh, homeschooling categorically eliminates bullying from your children's lives. Is that right? No. I would not say it does because we live in a society where um, we see bullying in all forms, um, whether you're employed or whether you're in school. Um, there is always bullies in our society, um, but it limits the bullying at a, um, a cohort level and does give the child a chance to learn some different skills um, so they can still uh, go ahead in life. They're, um, I think it does limit um, the day-to-day -day bullying that you would see in a school environment. Okay, let me pick up on that last point, Sarah, because, you know, one of the arguments we hear is that homeschooling has its advantages, and you've just listed what some of them are, but a potential disadvantage is the sort of natural everyday socialization um, that kids would get with other kids that they don't get if they're only being schooled at home. Can you speak to that? Um, there's a big difference in what homeschooling in our area looks like pre- and post-COVID. Um, before COVID, we would do about 30 to 45 field trips a year, uh, about one a week. Um, and that's in addition to uh, classes and volunteer opportunities and sports that we're running in our community. Um, now that we're dealing with COVID, um, a lot of operators that are operating are offering uh, field trips this year. Um, so we're limited in our opportunities that way. Uh, we've been forced to get creative with where we're going to meet. So right now, um, any sort of gatherings are happening at parks and conservation areas and hiking, um, as opposed to um, gyms and stuff like that. One more question for you here, Sarah, and that is there's no question that you know your children better than anybody else in this whole world. But are you sure you know how to teach well enough to make sure your children are well educated? If I don't know a subject matter, um, I can always, we have the ability to hire the tutor. Um, we have the internet. Uh, there are so many free classes, even at the university level. Um, I would say, am I qualified to teach calculus? No, um, I'm not, but um, I can always go and buy an online program. There's lots of opportunities for me to be creative with how to teach that should my children choose to learn it. Um, but as far as I'm able to, uh, I'm able to uh, adapt the curriculum to what my children individually need, and that is a huge advantage that I have. Okay, understood. Carlo, you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you've been getting a lot of uh, phone calls from people inquiring. What kinds of, uh, what do they want to know? What questions are they asking you? Um, well, there's um, quite a number of calls that we're getting. Of course, parents are just as concerned as um, you know, the, the general population in terms of uh, homeschooling. I asked uh, our person who's in charge of receiving phone calls and she said uh, on August 7th this week, it is lots of families who are terrified to send their children into large class settings. Families already dealing with other health issues, multi-generational homes that don't want COVID exposure. Uh, many are kindergarten younger, so they have fully registered for school, and they're relieved that they don't have to do public school kindergarten and uh, and so on. So some of the calls I receive are also people who are panicked. And I just want to say that there, there's been at least three studies that I'm aware of looking at how young people are coping as a result of, uh, you know, COVID-19 now that they've been thrown into this particular situation. And essentially what the data is showing that overall they're coping extremely well and that they're doing, uh, you know, stress levels are going down, their well-being is improving. And that seems to be a, a theme that's coming through it rather than the opposite, which is, oh, you know, young people aren't going to school. Their mental health is suffering. That's not what the data is showing. The data is showing that their mental health and stress is getting better and uh, they're improving their overall well-being. Yeah, we did a program about that very thing last week. Uh, 7,000 parents contributing to a parent survey and, and some good data and information there. But let me just uh, follow up, um, Carla, with some of the basic questions. I imagine some people call and want to know, A, is homeschooling legal? Just for the record, it's legal, right? 
Absolutely. We're very fortunate in Ontario. There's very low level regulation. And if parents want to homeschool, probably the first place to start is to just uh, read Program Policy Memorandum 131, which outlines, it's not very long, five to 10 pages, and it just gives you all the information you need to know about homeschooling. So if a parent wants to homeschool, there's Appendix D within Program Policy Memorandum 131. They just put their name down, their child's name down, and they fax it to the board. Uh, notifying that they want to homeschool, and then the board just sends back a letter of acknowledgement. Okay, so another, fast another fast question here. Another fast question. If you homeschool, it, it does not inhibit you or prohibit you from going to post-secondary after that's over, right? Absolutely not. So uh, there are many ways that homeschoolers use to get into post-secondary education. Sometimes they take top six, course, six courses only. Sometimes they write ACTs and SATs. Sometimes they use... Uh, portfolios. Uh, there are open universities, for example, Athabasca University is a fully accredited Canadian university. All you need to get in there is to be 16 years of age, you're automatically in. So you don't need a high school diploma, you don't need to show them your marks. Uh, if you're younger than 16, you just need a note from your parents and you're automatically in. All universities in Canada pretty much have uh, policies for homeschoolers and so on. Okay, Todd, how about this? Um, Sarah told us earlier that, that she is able uh, to create a curriculum that meets the specific needs of her children, uh, which is terrific. Um, and I guess as well, there's no obligation to write tests or exams or that kind of thing. So a unique curriculum, no obligation to write exams, it's quite different from what a typical kid would experience in a typical public school class. What's your view on that? Yeah, and I, I think uh, what, what Sarah outlined was, was wonderful. You know, she's really talking about the looking at the different areas of development that her kids need in terms of uh, skill sets. She's looking for resources online to supplement her own knowledge to be able to help develop those, those areas. And, and over time, she's really following her, her children to be able to ensure that they are de developing those skills. So that, that, that's excellent. I think one of the challenges is, is um, if you don't have the time to be able to invest in that, if you're just pulling your kids and you're not actually thinking about how do I go about moving my child through these developmental stages in, in um, uh, developing uh, academic skills and, and curriculum knowledge, that they might fall, fall behind. And, um, and there is definitely um, research that shows that when children aren't provided with access to the, the resources, such as a number of books and, and being able to practice reading and spelling and math, that they do fall behind quite quickly and then it takes longer to catch them up. So again, we need to be very intentional about homeschooling. This is not something we're just pulling them out because they were worried about um, their safety at school and we didn't like the online learning environment in the fall or the spring, so we, do, we don't want to do that again. And we're just going to kind of spend a year where we're just going to let them do whatever they want, want to do. Okay. We do have to be intentional about how we're structuring that time for them. And how about this, Todd? Do, do you have any um, sort of empirically provable evidence system-wide that would compare how literate, either in math or English or whatever, homeschooled kids are versus those who go through the public school system? I don't have anything about the homeschooling population, but we do know about what we kind of call about the summer slide, where students who come from homes that um, don't focus on the de um, development of literacy skills over the course of a couple months of, of the summer, that those students, um, they perform about two to three months um, behind those students whose families did um, help develop literacy skills or focus on literacy skills um, over this summer. So we do know that when we don't practice, we don't develop those skills. Mm. Sarah, what can you tell us about what you know as to how the math skills, the English skills, the knowledge of geography, whatever, pick, pick, pick your poison, as they say, uh, how your kids compare to kids who've gone through the public school system in the area you live? Um, I actually choose, so I have a choice, um, like any other homeschool in the province, um, to have my children write the EQAOs um, at grades three and six. Um, I have had my children go in and write those tests and they have scored very comparable to their counterparts who have been in the public school system um, in both um, reading and math. Um, for other areas, um, we do a lot of, uh, like I only focus on reading, writing, and math in the elementary grades. I add science when we get to high school. Um, and I also tailor our high school so it's very hands-on based on what the kids are interested in. 
Um, so my, my little boys right now who are 10 and 12 are interested in motors. So we have found them an old motor and they're currently tearing it apart to learn how it works and they'll be putting it back together. <laughs> um, my high schoolers want to be social workers. So we're learning um, the importance of creating really good reports, good listening skills, good active learning skills, um, connecting with people on an emotional level, things that would make a very valued social worker. Um, my twins both became welders. We did lots of welding classes through continuing ed at a local college. Um, so I would say that um, considering that they've graduated and are employable um, at the same age as those who've come out of the public school system, that my kids do uh, meet the bar. You sound like a good teacher too, Sarah. Uh, tell me this, um, in our last 30 seconds here, how, your oldest is in what grade? Uh, she's, my oldest is 21 and my youngest is 10. 21 to 10. Okay, so the, has the 21-year-old gone on to post-secondary education? Um, she was going to, but she decided that she loved working with dairy cows instead. Um, so she is a dairy herds person. Um, my twins graduated from Fanshawe College in the fall or in the, in the spring from uh, welding. Um, my next two want to be social workers, and my little boys, I think, want to be mechanics or farmers. <laughs> Terrific. You got all the bases covered there. Well done. Uh, I want to thank all three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us understand this phenomenon uh, a lot better, uh, a phenomenon which uh, presumably is going to be in higher demand thanks to COVID-19. Sarah Hornblower, Carlo Ricci, Todd Cunningham, good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And that is the agenda for Monday, September 14th, 2020. Today marks the end of an era at TVO. Our longtime makeup artist, Diane Rowe, begins her first official day in retirement. Now, it would be hard to overstate what Diane has done for TVO during her four decades here. Four decades. For the thousands of guests, she's made look fabulous on television over those decades. And for yours truly and the other hosts on this network. If I don't look so good these days, it's because Diane is no longer doing my makeup. I am. Diane, thank you from all of us. And may your next chapter be filled with all that's good. Tomorrow, we'll hear from the heads of Ontario teacher unions. Also, a look at why the stock market is up, even though the economy is down. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.